Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Racebot TV Friday Primetime with this, the IMSA Online Sports Car Championship. This week's venue will be a very legendary racetrack indeed. Circuit Spa, Frank Gauchamps will play host to the multi-class racing action that we have this evening. I am Connery Maddock. I'm joined by Ryan Walker for this one. It's a... Uh, well, it's multi-class racing, it's Spa, what more could you really ask for? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to this evening, and I think with the, the DPs, the GTs and the GT3s, I think we could be in for an exciting race, and also with the, the long straights as well, we could be in for some fantastic slipstreaming battles. Yep, that certainly is a big, big possibility. Having a look at the track information, though, it's pretty cool out there in terms of the track temperatures anyway. 18 degrees Celsius as we are in the morning hours here in Sim. Uh, towards dawn, we've got clear skies as well. So it's a beautiful morning in Belgium. We've got Paul Smith behind the scenes working all those cameras and all those graphics. Thanks to Istvan Ballo for providing our track camera pack uh, that we use here on Racesport TV for so many things. It really does add a little bit of a polish to our broadcasts here on the iRacing Esports Network. Here is the schedule for this season of Racebot TV Friday Primetime, the Insta Online Sports Car Championship. We are, well, fourth race of the season. Circuit Spa, Franco Champs next week. We'll be heading to Watkins Glen, and then we'll go to Barcelona and Silverstone to finish off the uh, finish off April, and then heading into the month of May, especially if you're an IndyCar fan. Uh, we go to Mid-Ohio, Snow Snowma Raceway, Road Atlanta, Circuit Gilles Villeneuve, and Belle Isle. So it's basically an entirely North American run through the month of May, and, uh, well, uh, certainly appropriate, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, some of those tracks I'm looking forward to, especially uh, Barcelona. I'm not sure if uh, this series is visited Barcelona, but if, if not, I think I'm looking forward to going there for the first time with the series and uh, seeing, seeing how the racing stacks up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm looking forward to this uh, particular race as well because whenever Spa is on the calendar for pretty much any road series, Ryan, it always brings in the numbers. We had over 450 people register for this particular session and uh, well we broadcast the top split here on Racebot TV Friday primetime so we're only going to get to see the top 38 drivers uh, that signed up uh, here and of course you know it's going to be a little bit more of a complicated situation with those Daytona prototypes as ever but should be good racing regardless up and down the field. Yeah uh, I'm uh, look, looking forward to seeing what these drivers can do. Uh, also, with it being a one-hour race, it'll be interesting to see what sort of, sort of strategies these drivers use. Uh, you know, last week, it, some of the drivers at uh, Road America tried to go as long as possible, and other drivers, they uh, went off strategy and tried something different. So maybe some drivers will do the same again around here tonight. But uh, like I mentioned, with the, the slipstream also as well, that will give these drivers possibly a chance to maybe uh, go off strategy or, or also uh, feel straight, feel, say, feel, I should say, to try something different with, with regards to strategy. Yeah, certainly very possible, especially considering the cooler track temperatures that we have here. Allow those tyres uh, to be able to go the distance and you can just focus on your fuel numbers. Of course, uh, with these GTEs and these GT3s uh, having their tyre wear increased, uh, when we had the new season patch, it, uh, it's uh, sometimes a struggle. Maybe not in these races, but we are sort of on the one of the longest races of the calendar here time-wise because we have the full hour to work with here at Spa as opposed to the 45 minutes that we're used to seeing. Yeah, and also just uh, with regards to the update as well, and also the the, the, t the tires like you mentioned, uh, these cars are on the latest tire model, so the early stage of the race through, uh, through the corners uh, like Oruz or Radio, and these drivers are going to have to be on their feet. They certainly are. We have to be on our feet as well because the drivers have just about come to the end of their qualifying session. We'll get that session switched over into race mode, so then we can show you the starting grid for this round of Racebot TV Friday Primetime on the iRacing Esports Network. Drivers going to get themselves stacked up 
behind the pace car as here is your Daytona prototype field. Tim Graven, pole position in that one. Nick Foster in P2. James King in the third spot in the prototypes with Gustav Scrimvergers in the fourth spot. Oliver Verole in P5. Zaltkul Goljkovic there in P6 with Christopher Zuschling in P7. And in your GTE field, this has a strength of field of 5,900. So quite spicy indeed. Daniel Lafonte pole position with a Ford GT. And you might see a theme coming down the field here today with all those Ford GTs. Carlos Fanalosa in P2. Patrick Henrich in P3. And Laurent Miskiewicz in P4. Arthur the Hook will start P5. Eric Goldner in P6 as the highest placed non Ford in that BMW M8. We have uh, Marcus Nunes in P7. Ross Woodford is the highest placed Porsche in the field here today. Sergio Agancio in P9. John DeValle in P10. James Minska and Dmitry Kofanov will round out the top 12 in GTEs. Mohamed Patel, Jackie Lotterman, Giuseppe Moya and Josh Thompson will bring things down to P16 in class. In your GT3 field, it's a lot of Audis. Moreno Sarika and Andre Melchers will be your front row starters with Nicholas Kowitz and Andreas Fernandez. Uh, Andres Fernandez, excuse me, bringing things down to P4. Ishmael Martel in P5. Ariel Bernardi in P6. Samuel Gorana in P7. Soren Kolosia in P8. Louis Goodway P9. Daniel Herrera in P10. Salo Souza in P11, Andres Batoni in 12th. We have Kirill Verhev uh, in P13, Vlad Kimicev P14, and uh, Haroldas uh, Jot Autas in P15. Some of those names very difficult, but we'll plow on here in the IMSA Online Sports Car Championship. I am glad you've decided to join us here at Spa Franco Champs. You can see that Daytona prototype field. Going to be heading their way through the bus stop chicane in just a couple of moments' time. And we won't be too long away, too far away from getting this race started. Of course, this little sort of pace lap being able to split up the field into their constituent parts. But soon the field will be under the control of Tim Graven. It's a calm approach towards La Source. The green flag does come out after La Source because it is the endurance pits here. So just a little bit of time now before we'll get racing in towards Eau Rouge and Radion. Tim Graven then exit the La Source. He goes pedal to the metal and we will go green flag racing in the IMSA Online Sports Car Championship at Spa. Frank Oshamps, everyone single file in the Daytona prototype field. Everyone seemingly okay coming through Eau Rouge and Radion for the first time. But looking back at your GTE field, is it going to be the same for them through the first couple of corners? I am seeing that the case with the top five cars at the moment. They're side by side between Del Valle and Agancio. There's a big wreck though in towards Radion and there's another spinner as well. Jackie Lottman goes uh, off towards the left-hand side of your picture, but there's a car on their roof. Uh, that's Marcos Nunes having a massive, massive problem at the start of the race. He was uh, side by side in a battle, I believe. No, he wasn't even involved in the battle. He just got caught up in it, got tagged in the rear and out into traffic. He goes, break dance that Ford GT, and he sits on his roof for a while just wondering what happened. Yeah, it just looks like on the entry, he just uh, might have just lost the rear end and uh, on cold tyres and just unfortunately got just lost the rear end, got sideways. And yeah, he basically got uh, uh, punched into a row and unfortunately there was nothing he could do. Yeah, it wasn't his instant at all. He just got tagged from behind, it seems. Meanwhile, GT3s have had their start as well. You can see a little bit of slight side-by-side -side action between Bernardi and Martel there. That's for position number five and six in class at the moment as they'll continue their way through No Name Corner and on the run in towards Puon then. It seems like the GT3s have been probably the most okay field here uh, so far. You can class the Daytona prototypes being up there as well. 
as they've had no massive dramas here in the opening of the race. It seems like all the action is in the GTE field at the moment. That's Arthur the Hook going very wide through the second stab below, but he hasn't lost a lot of time as a result. And now the draft will really, really be felt on the way through Blanchemont and on the run in towards the bus stop chicane. And Ross Woodford looking for a move on Patrick Henrik, but he'll stay in line for now. Is there any big sends here? There, there, there is. John DeValle sent it on the brakes into the chicane and tagged Eric Goldner around. That's a bit of an embarrassing one, as we'll see it on the replay. Yeah, it looks like it was uh, in the background as well. There are a couple of cars they uh, collided with each other into into the final chicane. We'll see it. There we go. That's not how you try to overtake cars into the bus stop chicane on lap number one. Eric Golden of the innocent party in that as he gets tagged around from a driver trying to make a move from what felt four or five car lengths back there into the braking zone. But Goldner will continue on his way. Still close action out there on track right now. You see this battling towards Ravage in the Detail prototype says Zoshlen tries to pull off a move here on uh, Grimbergus. And he's really, really scrapping for it. Grimbergus on the inside here, trying to hang on. They'll continue to go side by side through No Name Corner. And now on the way in towards Puan they go. And uh, it's seeming like there's nothing going to be separating this battle just for the moment. They'll stick close, but side by side no longer, no longer through the downhill double apex left. Yep, it looks like Christopher is a, was a crooked driver in this day, or from what I see anyways. It looks a bit, it looks a bit eager to try and get by, and Grimberg has just decided not to fight that. That was Giuseppe Moya trying to go down the inside or follow traffic through on a BMW here. It's going to be battling in towards... Ah, there we go. No name corner. That spins it out in towards the tyre barriers. He's able to get it going, though, and doesn't really have to hang around for any traffic to come through. So he avoids the awkward situation, Ryan, of having to wait on the exit of the corner, try and let traffic through. He was able to get going pretty quickly, and as a result, he didn't lose as much time as you would expect with the field being so close at this stage. Yeah, he didn't have, he didn't have to wait too, uh, too long. He just uh, There wasn't really that many cars behind him, but... Uh, luckily, he managed to get going again without causing any issues, and they rejoined the track in a safe manner. Meanwhile, this is your GTE race lead. Daniel Lafonte from Carlos Penalosa. And then we'll have Miss Hewitt and LaHook as P3 and 4 at the moment. And, well, they're keeping in their train at the moment. There's some slight separation between P2 and P3. You can see that on the run into Eau Rouge. But those drivers behind having to hope that that's not going to grow much larger over the next couple of laps. They want to keep themselves in contention here as far as the race lead goes. They can't really afford to let this pair get away from them at the front of the field. And uh, that's the overall task for now. You can see the flashing of the lights. Oh, there's a big sand off of the hook down the inside of Miss Kiewicz into the Lacombe chicane. And, it was a pretty clean pass, all things considered. It was just last minute. Yeah, absolutely. That was a that was a bit of a, a bit of a brave move by Arthur, but they luckily managed to pull it off. So managed to gain another position. But yeah, we know how quick Arthur can be uh, after watching him watching him last week at uh, Road America, where he, he managed to take the one from his teammate Josh Thompson. Yeah, there we go. We saw that pass it pass in action coming through. The Lacombe chicane, and now we give a little bit of love to the GTE, uh, GT3 field, excuse me, because uh, they had their start kind of ruined by the incident that we saw into Oruj Radion in the GTE field, so we didn't quite catch it, but now's a better time than any to give you a bit of an update. Andre Melcher's leads from Moreno Sarika. You also have Andres Fernandez in third place and Ishmael Martel in fourth place in that particular class and it seems like the same situation is happening here in GT3s as is happening in GTEs it's a pair at the front trying to break away from the rest yeah absolutely it's, it's, uh, these guys at, uh, up at the front are trying to get away uh, but yeah uh, we know what Spar's like if you can stay in the slipstream with someone in front of you you can you can try and keep up with them on the straight and also repass them but on the other hand you can also stay behind them and just uh, do a bit of fuel saving uh, like I mentioned before the start of the race. On 
board with Sirica at the moment. He can just tuck within that draft and keep him close and also he can use it to his benefit when it comes to hitting fuel numbers as well. And of course, yeah, there's no way you'll be able to cut out a, uh, a lap on the stop here, but all this is doing is to make that stop that you do have to do just that little bit shorter because it is going to be uh, fuel only in these cars. And uh, we'll just get to see how that all files through when we get towards the halfway stage of the race. But uh, for now, it's all just about cons consolidating position at the moment. And in GTEs, there's a bit of action going on for P number five, Miss Hewitt. And they're involved with Henry here, I believe, on the way into the coup. Let's see how it happens. Yeah, just watching the it's Stewart's now, he tries to go up the inside and it looks like he gets the move done and up the inside, the clean move up into P5 and uh, Heinrich loses a position. Yeah, there we go. So, 52 minutes left remaining now. Well, despite that big old frantic uh, GTE start on lap number one, things to have, have seemed to have calmed down relatively quickly here and that is in stark contrast to one of the races I broadcasted a couple of days ago in the uh, Danish Esports Racing Championship where there was wheel-to-wheel -wheel action basically for the entirety of the event. These guys taking a little bit uh, calmer, a little bit more collected and maybe, just maybe, that'll set, up, set, set ourselves up for some good racing through the final couple of stages. But you can see this Daytona prototype race lead is still relatively close at the moment as well. Tim Graven on previous rounds has been able to run away with things at the front of the field. He's been the, the class of the field in Daytona prototypes, but maybe not so much here because Nick Foster is giving him a run for his money. Yeah, absolutely. But like we, uh, we seen last week at Road America with Tim Graven, he managed to pull away and uh, pretty much uh, took a dominant one, but uh, this race so far, he's not been able to pull away and dominate. Uh, and yeah, Nick Foster's keeping him honest. And, uh, Nick Foster, I believe, races in real life as well. So, yeah, it's good to see more real-life drivers getting involved uh, in the sim racing scene. Yeah, absolutely. It's just becoming more and more common nowadays, and uh, it, it's starting to get to the point where I'm not surprised that uh, uh, we see so many real drivers on the racing side of things. It's uh, absolutely fantastic, and I hope it continues even after the current situation the world is going through, because uh, to have that sort of experience on the sim is going to be very useful in terms of feedback for developers. But meanwhile, I'm watching this battle deep in GT3 field at the moment, at 23 and the 29 of Samuel Grana and Salo Sousa went side by side into the bus stop that time around. And it was uh, Grana actually able to pull off the pass into that section, but he did benefit from uh, taking a, a liberal de definition with the track limits to watch him on. Yeah, I, I uh, saw the same thing as well. He, he was a—he uh, on the cusp of be going off track, but I think he was still within track limits. But uh, watching this battle for second place in the TP class as well, with, uh, between uh, Carlos and Arthur, and uh, yeah, uh, Arthur seems to be—he doesn't seem to be uh, eager to get back by. He seems to be more than—he seems more than happy to sit behind at the moment. So he's maybe. Maybe waiting until the pit stops to uh, maybe try and jump Carlos in the pit stops. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, the strategy game in full effect for both your GT fields already, uh, I have to say, at this stage. Maybe there's a couple of drivers in mid-pack and uh, towards the back that will want to try and prioritize track precision at the moment. For these guys inside the top five, inside the top ten, there is no rush really to go anywhere unless you feel like you're being held up. Uh, by the driver ahead and you can go much faster in the pressure air but for now for most of these drivers it's just sit behind uh, just conserve a little bit and uh, make the shorter stop work uh, when you come in for for that scheduled stop yeah absolutely as a this is a looking further back as well in that class to see if there's anything else going on and uh, yeah, the, the highest climber in the GT class at the moment, uh, I believe, is Josh Thompson. He started the, the last night class, I believe, and is it up into about, uh, yeah, uh, round about the mid, the mid pack at the moment. Yeah, just hanging out in that Williams Esports machine, and well, he does have a good couple of friends in this race. One of them, Arthur Hook, who is currently sitting in third place. 
for Williams Esports. So it's uh, it's not all alone out there for Josh Thompson, but uh, right now his objective is just to get relatively close to that top five, and he's not too far off of doing so. Uh, mind you, he's trying to gain on Ross Woodford at the moment, and I'm seeing him gaining about uh, just under a tenth of a second on that last lap. But meanwhile, 4GT is going nose to diffuser. There's not much, there isn't really any rear bumper on these things. It is all diffuser on these 4GTs. It's the battle for second place between Fenelosa and Arthur Hook. And uh, I gotta say though, the the rear bodywork of these 4GTs, I'm a massive fan. Yeah, I'm a big fan as a big fan of it as well. I, I've always been, I've also been a big fan of the Ford GT in real life, and uh, it was it was, uh, it was sad that the, the Ford GT program in real life came to an end because I have to say, uh, not everyone will agree with me. Uh, some people say that the, the Ford GT just sounded like uh, it sounded awful, but I have to say it's, it looked and sounded awesome. But that's, that's my thoughts on it. Of course, with the recent. Uh performance adjustment in GTEs. It seems like it's become the favourite car at the moment, especially here at Spa. But of course, as we go to other tracks, maybe that will change as Arthur the Hook seeks the inside into the bus stop, goes very deep on the brakes into here. He is able to make the apex of, as well, so gets that pass done over Fenelosa. Fenelosa looking to try and get the run off the corner to try and challenge into last source, but he doesn't get anything at all. And Arthur the Hook just stuck a crowbar in and just crack that inside open look at that yeah absolutely he, I, I was just watching Arthur as well he got a great run great run through Blonsum on and then managed to get a great run on Carlos and get up the inside into the into the bus stop and pull the move off under braking so yeah Arthur up into second place now and uh, on the attack uh, on the attack uh, to try and catch the leader yeah man it's uh, it is La Hook. He is the well. He isn't the highest I-rated driver in the GTE field. That actually goes to Patrick Henry. But here's the number three car. Which, if you're new to I-racing, your car numbers are determined by how high your I-rating is. So the highest I-rating driver gets number one. The second highest number two. The third highest number three, and so on down the field. So if you're seeing some of these drivers with 34s and 31s and things like that, that means they're towards the uh, towards the back in terms of I rating. So you can, it's a good benchmark to see if people are over or underperforming here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, quite quite interesting as well. With uh, the amount of drivers I've seen with high I ratings on I race, and they seem to yeah, most of the time the drivers I've watched with high high I ratings are real, real quick on I, on I racing or some racing in general. And uh, yeah, uh, just watching on board the the Barino Sarico as well. They currently trying to put some pressure on the leader and Andre Meltzer. Yeah, this is in GT threes, and well, this leading pair has been reeled in a little bit over the last couple of laps. There's a mistake from Meltzer's into Rod's Ravage, but he's able to pick it up. He's able to recover. It did have it did mean that Sarico had to check up a little bit and. All that has done has resulted in Martel and Fernandez starting to close in, so it might end up being a four-car pack for the race lead in the not too distant future if there are more mistakes from the race leader like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, as far as one of those tracks, if, uh, if you make a mistake right here, people behind you will have to take the opportunity and they uh, gain some positions. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's uh, some corners that you can make a mistake around, uh, especially a uh, Blonsum on it and also through the Paul Rouge and Radion. It's uh, just what those corners are so easily, or so it's so easy to make a mistake in those corners, I should say. It is on board with Sarika. And we'll get to see if he's just saving fuel or if he's actually trying to <laughs> take the race lead at this point, but We'll just have to see what exactly the plan is for the driver of the number seven Audi. Defensive from Melchers in towards the bus stop chicane. And Sarika, he almost picked the wrong line there, almost ran into the back of Melchers into the braking zone. Granted, Melchers, that was a very late change of direction coming up towards the braking zone. So you can understand that being a little bit frustrating for uh, Sarika. Yeah, but it was a bit of a bit of a late move under braking from uh, Meltzer's. Uh, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but yeah, he was lucky that uh, Sarika didn't run in, run into the back of him. There we go. 
Fantastic shot as the cars run down the hill through Eau Rouge and into Radion. There's a car that's taken a bit too much of the curve there. I think that was Fernandez that might have just gotten himself a slowdown penalty. But now you can see it is a leading trio. Three cars battling it out for the GT3 race lead. A bit of a luck from Sarika into the braking zone of their comb. But he has to be careful now because, yes, he's been focusing ahead of him and uh, watching what Melchers does. But now he has a, a driver behind him filling up his uh, wing and rear view mirrors. And Ishmael Martel, well, it still remains to be seen whether he'll be aggressive with this or just sit behind. Yeah, I was just about to say as well, Sarika, he can, uh, he can try and attack uh, Melchers in front of him. But he's lost a bit of ground to him, so he's going to have to keep an eye on his mirrors behind him with uh, Martel. So... But like you mentioned, uh, will Martel try and try and get by as quickly as possible, or is he more than happy to just uh, sit sit behind for the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, these guys trying to hit their fuel numbers simultaneously while trying to negotiate these positions. But look at this overall race lead. It's Tim Graven, Nick Foster, and Nick Foster has recently been able to get himself into the race lead, and we'll see the replay of that happening. Simple move on the bricks down the inside into Lecum, and not too much of a problem there from the driver from Australia or New Zealand, as that is a combined club on our racing. But yeah, Nick Foster to the race lead, and uh, Tim Graven didn't really fight it. I think he might just take this as an opportunity to slip to the safe. Yeah, absolutely. It looked like uh, Tim was, uh, he didn't really put up much of a fight. He just, uh, what, Nick got the run and he let him go. And uh, I believe that Nick and Tim are also teammates, so they, that's probably the reason why. Yeah, they could share. We can see a replay of this, though. Ross Woodford involved in something here. I think Josh Thompson was able to get past him into the comb. And you can see that 4GT swing to the inside, back in line before the breaking zone even comes through so simple pass there for Josh Thompson as he steadily works his way through the field he's up 10 spots in class at the moment so Josh Thompson making short work of the GTE field and when you consider that GTE strength of field is 5,900 that's not an easy feat yeah absolutely not it's a uh... But also, we know how quick Josh can, uh, Josh can be uh, on iRacing. He's uh, probably one of the quickest drivers on the service. He's uh, one of the DPs he's had issues into the bus stop. Uh, this is Zoshling. Let's have a look to see what the problem was. Was it with this Audi? It might have been. Down the inside. And the gas just swaps ends. Rear end brakes loose. It's a DP that has to take avoiding action behind. I think that was Greenbergers that had to uh, nip his way through the chicane instead of the normal line through the chicane. It's another altercation with an Audi into Eau Rouge. And that did not road time. So I'm not having a great day with the traffic at the moment, but that was just a simple case of wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, it was just uh, unfortunate for, for Christopher. He just lost it in the bus stop and then unfortunately got caught up behind a GT3 car through Eau Rouge and Radion and uh, yeah it's fast and lights and frustrating but uh, it's like the, the general rule in multi-class racing the slow class car doesn't have to move offline it's the responsibility of the, the quicker class car to get by safely it's leading three cars for GTEs at the moment as well as the fuel saving games continue in this one after the hook has a bit of a run on your race leader but if trend is to be believed he'll just lift out and do the big old lift and ghost into the Lacombe chicane so th this first portion of the race Ryan is basically just the uh, just the center for the second half because these guys they're just focused on getting that shortest fuel stop possible and then potentially we'll get some some more side-by-side -side action in the latter parts of this race but for now drivers just playing it very very safe which I'd rather them do then find a barrier somewhere. Yeah, see, it's the same at Road America uh, last week as well. The, most drivers weren't trying to, they weren't really trying to battle away the, in the early stages. They were just kind of just trying to settle down into into a position that they were happy with. And just they, if they were if they were stuck behind the car, they were just doing doing uh, the old lifting and coasting technique and trying to save as much fuel as possible, and also using that slipstream. So I think these drivers are doing the same again. They're not they battling away too much. They're just kind of. Waiting until, until the pit stops are done and then they, in the closing stages, that's when they'll start to get their elbows out. Potentially. 
and it could happen a bit earlier as well if drivers feel hard done by by particularly aggressive moves. It only takes that one spark to ignite an inferno here. But P5 in GT3s, Bernardi versus Kolodis. Uh, I cannot pronounce that last name for the life of me. I've been trying over the past four weeks to get it right. There's probably someone out there that has to actually tell me exactly how Soren's name is pronounced, but uh, there we go. You can see that pass come through the first sector, and uh, there we go. We can return back to the live pictures. And uh, you can see them heading their way through Puan, which is an absolutely fantastic portion of the racetrack. I've, uh, the people have heard me sing its praises too much in races at Spa, but I, I do love that. Yeah, my favourite my favorite corner around Spa has to be a... Uh, yeah, or two, two favourite corners uh, even around Spa has to be a... Uh, uh, not Radion, a uh, Ponsonman, and uh, also Oruz and Radion, just because... Uh, it's just uh, when you take those corners flat out and you nail it, it just feels so rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Look at this, GTEs. It, it's, it's a big old slipstream draft fuel-saving train at the front of the field. Uh, Daniel LaFonte at the front, LaHook, Fenelosa and Henrik in that order. As uh, you can see that lone wolf of Miss Kiewitz in... Uh, fifth place at the moment. He sits about 2.1 seconds off of that leading train. I'm just checking to see... Yeah, he's not gaining on it. You can see the lap time deltas in the bottom right. He's not gaining on the top four, but he, he has to be looking behind now because look at that. Josh Thompson gained two tenths of a second two laps ago. It's only about half a tenth of a second on lap 10, but those, those lap times, those deltas, all in a racing driver's favorite color, Ryan. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it does. It, it got what's big, but just uh, watching Josh right now uh, on board with him, you can guarantee it. Josh Thompson will be pushing, pushing like crazy to try and catch up to him. And uh, yeah, we know how the uh, at times Josh, uh, Josh can be aggressive. Uh, I think he uh, watching him a few times lately. He's been not as aggressive. He's kind of like learned to control it, and he's not been. He hasn't made as many mistakes as he has in the past. So it's good to see Josh uh, improving. Yeah, it is good to see. Of course, basically started at the back in terms of qualifying here. So he has just uh, had to pick his way through the field. And now he's in a position where, you know, 35 minutes from the end of this race, not even at the halfway stage at the moment. And he's around about, I would say, just about 10 or so seconds off of that leading train of four cars. So it's not too bad of a job that uh, Josh Thompson has done here. Maybe he sacrificed, though, doing a bit of fuel saving just to gain those track positions early on, though. So I'd expect his stop times to actually be longer than uh, a lot of the others in GTEs. Yeah, I think he, with Josh starting at the back of this class, he's, he's kind of in the early stage of the race. He's just he tried to gain as many positions as possible before he makes his pit stop. And I don't know, maybe through... Oh, is it up at the, G, the front of the GT class? We've got a battle for the league going on. Yeah, that was Arthur the Hook making his way through. I don't think he wanted it, <laughs> to be completely honest, because he left, lifted out completely on the way into the braking zone, but Lafuente continued to do his big lift and coast into, uh, into Le Combe, and the Hook was positioned towards the inside there, and there we go. Decides to eventually bring it in, and... Uh, Le Hook now race leader in GTEs and La Fuente in second place. But yeah, I, I'm not sure if that was entirely intentional. Yeah, I think he, he just decided to back out, back out of that move once uh, La Hook was up uh, La Hook was up inside the uh, Yeah, just decided to let him go and maybe try and use off or in front of him uh, as a slip stream and uh, also uh, save some fuel as well. I think uh, he might have just uh, clicked on it off was doing the same thing. Yeah, so just to give you an update on race lead battles, because you have overall race leads, looks like this, two and a half tenths of a second between these two guys at the moment, as Graven gets a big run into Oru and Radion, and that will result in a good stream on the way down the Kemmel Strait as well, but whether or not he'll be able to do anything with it, whether or not he is willing to do anything with it is still a big question, and you can just see he's sitting behind try and hit those fuel numbers same is the case in gtes same is the case in gt3 so basically control c control v all strategy right now yeah so it looks like a uh, most of these guys are just they uh, like again they're not, not wanting to battle they battle way too much they're kind of just 
more than content to sit where they are. So, yeah, these guys are just kind of, it's, uh, it's basically a game of follow the leader at the moment. Yeah, but we are getting to the point where we'll start to see the first couple of uh, pit stops because about 33 minutes left remaining, maybe after the next lap for these guys, then we'll start to see drivers coming in. I haven't seen anyone come in just yet for a scheduled stop. The only drivers on pit lane or have come on towards pit lane are actually retirement, so they're actually staying there. So, uh, uh, Gorjkovic, we have Nunez, and we have Jackie Lottemann. Uh, that are the three retirements from this race so far. We still have 35 cars left running out there. So, ring of attrition has been pretty good here for the moment. But with the well, with the first and only set of stops looming, uh, we'll get to see if the fuel savings enough for these drivers in these tracks. Yep, as a okay, this uh, once and the pass are coming, just about to come across the line. And uh, yeah, and uh, also in the background, we've got the two DP leaders coming up to lot them. So the DPs are, uh, well, the DP leaders anyway, are uh, starting to get in amongst the GT3 and GT traffic. Yeah, you can see those, well, P1, P2 in Daytona prototypes coming through on the drive up Lewis Goodway, Goodway there. So that is solidly mid pack in the GT3s at the moment. So they still got a decent amount of traffic to come through on and it, you know the closer to the front of this GT3 field the more congested everything is you see Christopher Zoschling down on towards the pit lane so that is the first scheduled stop here uh, and it comes from a Daytona prototype meanwhile there was a swap for the race lead and negotiated swap as well all down the Campbell Strait Tim Graven to the pointy end of the field now as uh, Foster has to pull behind yep but it looks like a it looks like Foster didn't put up too much of a fight, or maybe he did, he went to the inside to try and defend possibly, but yeah, he just decided to like, uh, let his teammate uh, Tim go, so yep, uh, another ch another chance for the lead, and uh, and also with uh, this uh, pit lane as well, Connor, it's, uh, it's also the endurance layout, so it's a longer pit lane, so that's going to be another factor, I think, uh, when do people stop, and also you have to take into account that uh, they might lose some time with it being a longer, longer pit lane layout. Yeah, absolutely. Meanwhile, if you want live timing, the live timing link is slightly different from what you're used to seeing from us at RaceSpot. It's racespot.tv forward slash live is the timing link. So not forward slash timing, it's forward slash live uh, for this particular race because we have another event going on that is using the original timing link. So racespot.tv forward slash live here for the IMSA Online Sports Car Championship. You can see the GTE field is now five cars strong at the uh, at the pointy end of it. So a group of four becomes a group of five as Miss Stewart has now gained a lot of time on these guys. And uh, it, it's just a case of uh, a game of chicken at the moment. Who can actually go slower to try and save the most fuel? Yeah, I was just about to say Miss Stewart is a uh, closed up a lot on these guys, and they. I'm also just uh, watching in the background as well. Oh, as a, a couple, a, a Soren dies into the pits in the GT3 class, and also uh, I believe the, one of the deep leaders died into the pits. Yeah, it was Tim Graven. Yeah, Tim Graven in. We have a GTE GT3, excuse me, in as well. That's Soren Kolodzi. As again, there's probably ten different variations of that name I've gone through. We see Samuel Grana come in as well. So the first couple of GT3s are now angling towards the pit lane and we'll have to wait and see if there are any GTEs that are going to decide to do the same as well. There's Tim Graven in and it's a very, very, very long pit lane here, Ryan. You do not want to go get any form of penalty around here. Otherwise, that is your race completely and utterly done. You can see he's 50 seconds on the pit lane before he's even got to his pit box. Yeah, it's uh, this long, the, the longer pit lane around Spa, uh, it just feels like you're on the pit limit. Full for, yeah, full minute. It feels like uh, even an eternity. So, and also that uh, that pit wall and turn what, uh, the, yeah, the pit wall and uh, the turn one or the, the shorter pit lane, you don't want to clip it either. Otherwise, it, you'll get big damage. Yeah, there's basically a hairpin in the middle of this pit lane uh, before you go down the hill through the old pit stalls and. See, now Tim Graven be able to go off and away and we'll be able to rejoin the circuit just after Radion. And 
but uh, seemingly no nonsense stop there for Tim Raven and no nonsense uh, bit of space as well so he's got a bit of clean air to work with yes he has that 4 GT just ahead of him but the closing speed of these Detour prototypes compared to the GTEs are nowhere near like is nowhere near like they are in say LMP1 and GTEs it's going to take him a bit of time to uh, get that past done yeah absolutely as a yeah back at back in the TT class as well, we've still got this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah, about 5, five car pack going on and they, these guys have not really been separated and Josh Thompson's not been able to close the gap to these guys so unfortunately Josh's not got anyone to slipstream to catch up so at the moment it's uh, these bunch of cars that are still in, in a battle for the lead. Yeah, I have to remember Josh is also using a lot of fuel as well but meanwhile it's a big old group of GT3s. It's a GT3 pit party. There's a Detour prototype in the middle of it as well as, as a guest. But uh, you can see Nick Foster going to be finding his pit box in just a couple of moments. But they have to negotiate that hairpin in the middle. Oh, Foster? Ooh. Whoa, okay. He's just it taking the tow. Did he run out of fuel? Yeah, I think he might have run out of fuel. I think uh, Foster's went, what is it, one, one lap too long. Oh... Yeah, you can just see him. He's out. That engine, that engine's not healthy. And he has to take the tow back to pit lane, which he was already on. So that's an interesting situation. That's an embarrassing one for Nick Foster as well. Trying to go the, the extra lap, but just marginally out of fuel there. That is unfortunate. But meanwhile, GT3 pit stops in effect right now. Everyone has come down in with the exception of Moreno Sarika in the number seven car. Everyone else in GT3s is on the pit lane at the moment. And now Sarika, has he been able to save enough to go the one extra lap? He is the only man out there in GT3s to actually go for this. Yeah, it looks like, uh, it looks like Sarika might have just uh, managed to stretch out uh, or save an extra lap of fuel. It would be amazing if he could pull this off, but uh, he's not got anyone in front of him to try and slipstream to try and uh, just to be safe and save that the extra lap for fuel. So this will be interesting. It will be. Let's have a look then. He's going to have to come down in this time around. If he goes one more lap, then that is a massive mistake, unless he's like the fuel whisperer or something in that Williams Jimmy sports car. But. You can see now through Bonjamoni goes, soon the Audi will be coming on to the pit lane. Uh, meanwhile, the race off of pit lane was won by Andres Fernandez, so he's in second place at the moment and might inherit the race lead once Sirica makes his stop. There he is, down on towards the pit lane. He'll be out of there in about uh, two minutes' time. Yeah, round about that, but he... Yeah. Yeah, they... As uh, the director, the direct, director has said, it's uh, 25. So, yeah, 25 percent uh, of the way there. Yeah, give me that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there we go. Looking at GT3s, there's a couple of GTEs ahead of these guys as well. There's Andres Fernandez, who is basically in an active battle with Sarika, who's currently on the pit lane at the moment. So this is a sort of uh, battle of the pit stops here in the middle of the race. Uh, Fernandez coming through the second Stablo. Sarika has yet to get to his pit box at the moment, so it's just going to be a moment before he's able to do so. And in fact, he is stationary now. We've seen stop times of around about 23 seconds, 24 seconds for GT3. So that's around about the mark that we'll see Sarika down in for as well. He's 14 seconds on his stop as Fernandez comes into the bus stop. There is the track map up on screen for you now. You can see that number seven in the pit lane. They actually get it going. So here we go. I think Sarika might just be okay, but it's gonna be close to call here. As you can see now, Fernandez coming out of La Source and Sarika is out and no sign of Fernandez just yet. Sarika actually more clear out in the front of the field than I thought. That extra lap of fuel saving is an absolute wonders. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was a textbook uh, pit stop from the Sarika. I managed to nail the entry and nail the pit stop and nail the pit exit. And yeah, just uh, looking in the background as well, uh, second place is <laughs> not really that close. Yeah. 
you can see his stop time was 21.8. Meanwhile, uh, Hernandez's stop was uh, actually much shorter than a lot of the other GT3 runners. Because I did say that the average GT3 stop was around about 23.5 to 24 seconds. But Hernandez also had a very short stop. He was only 22 seconds. Uh, on the uh, stationary on the pit lane, very similar to what Sirico was able to manage. So has uh, Fernandez maybe done a bit of a cheeky short field here? Yeah, quite possibly. He might have the uh, short field to try and uh, keep in touch with Sirico, but on the other, other hand, so that's a that's a on the other hand, that's a big risk to take uh, with the uh, Spar being such a long track. So that could it could pay off, but it's uh, that'll be touch and go. Thing is for him, he has no drafting partner at the moment, so it's going to be a big struggle uh, to save fuel. Meanwhile, GTEs, we're still waiting for the GTEs to come down in. Currently, your overall race leader is actually a GTE because the Daytona prototypes have come in. They actually file in behind the GTEs for position when they do their pit stop. So as a result, Arthur the Hook, despite being in the second fastest class, is currently the overall race leader. As a... Uh, yeah, as uh, Laurent comes into the pits as well, so maybe he's uh, either he's not he's not managed to save enough fuel, or maybe he's trying a, a cheeky undercut. Yeah, there we go. There's uh, something interesting in the Twitch chat that I've just seen. Maybe the fuel was only good enough for the Grand Prix pits rather than the endurance pits for that Daytona prototype that we saw run out of fuel uh, coming down the pit lane. Maybe just maybe, but you know, it's just that extra, you know couple of hundred billions of fuel. Here's the battle for the race lead in GTEs though. The Fuente around the outside of Le Hook on the brakes into Le Cum. Le Hook's gonna fight it this time around. They trade paint through the corner and now Le Fuente, he's not quite clear just yet. Le Hook will continue the fight on the inside through Malmedy. There's a bit of a run for Le Fuente but he still can't get clear into Ravage. Down the hill they go through the right-hander. It's 4GT versus 4GT here. La Fuente gives him a bit of a shove. The hook pushed towards the outside. He's not going to be too happy about that. And now Patrick Henry is getting himself involved, but the hook will surrender the position. Yeah, and also this could be the this could be the lap that these guys are putting. So yeah, the trap position coming to the pit lane is going to be very important. So these guys are starting to yeah scrap amongst themselves and try and get in front of each other before coming into the pits. Because they yeah, I think it would depends where they, they, where they are in pit road, then that could make the difference. Yep, there we go. It could well make the difference as the Fuente, he's been able to pull out a good couple of tenths of a second here. That will be eaten into because of the draft on the way through the final sector, though. But still, that slight margin might be all you need when it comes to a pit stop battle. There's a Daytona prototype that's also trying to disrupt this at the moment well within their rights to do so that's tim graven who is your Daytona prototype race leader at the moment but not the overall race leader like we've already said that overall race leader comes down in towards the pits all four of them come down in at the very same time it's the battle of the pit crews some of them going late on the brakes to try and get the pit lane speed limit perfect uh coming down in without losing too much time but henrik and the hook they're in but they're close in particular there's uh, only a couple of meters between them at the moment yeah, they, these guys are really bunched up in the pit lane, and like you say, they most these guys they basically try to break as long as possible. They break as late as possible, rather they come into the the pit, pit, pit lane speed limit, limit line. So, yeah, these guys are trying to gain every second. I see what Arthur the Hook's doing. He's uh, he's actually got the pit limiter off, I think, and he's just teasing on the 60 kilometers an hour, up to 61 kilometers an hour limit. You can just see how close he's getting to Henrich. Luckily, they're in their pit boxes now, so there won't be any contact uh, between the two of them as they all get very, very close. They're all trying to block each other's views to try and get stopped in their pit boxes here as I think what's going on. And uh, now they finally get themselves stopped, but just take your bet because I don't know who's coming off this pit lane first. Uh, if, it was, if I was a betting man, I would have to say uh, La Hook. Uh, that's my money. As oh, a... Henry. Oh, La Hook. Oh, he got up to speed very quickly there. He actually got up to 65 kilometers an hour. It's five kilometers an hour above the pit lane speed limit to be able to make that happen. So La Hook teasing with a penalty there as he does come out with the, with, with the class lead. But 
we'll know in a couple of moments' time whether or not he's actually gotten penalty for bit lane speeding there. Yeah, that'll be unfortunately if he does get a penalty, but yeah, that was a bit... It kind of made me laugh eh, with the with the Arthur, he's teasing those guys, but eh, he's managed to come back out in the leading class and uh, Laurent, is, Laurent is up into P3. Yeah, he is uh, Penalosa also involved in this, but he is down to P4 at the moment. There's a GT3 that's kind of not really helping him at the moment. Uh, as you can see, it's that sort of trio at the back of the picture. Uh, as you see, Miss Goetz working his way around at the moment. But look at this, the uh, uh, leading pet down the inside of uh, Audi through Puan, and they're able to get clear of it. And uh, so is Miss Goetz as well. He, he didn't want to hang around and get held up by a GT3 machine, but the pack of five has been reduced to a pack of three because of the pit stop mix. Yep, and uh, yeah, this is a uh, basically the state of the race where uh, technically you could you could say uh, the gloves are off, and uh, no pun intended with that. <laughs> of course, of course, but uh, <laughs> it's. Uh... <laughs> But we've given a lot of love to the GTEs at the moment. The hook leading from Henrik from Miss Gewitz because they just had their pit stop phase. But uh, elsewhere, things seem to have calmed down a little bit. The race lead in GT3s. Oh, that's an instant there. There's number 17 around. And uh, Kimichev involved in that. He was the car that got spun and didn't quite see who exactly the other driver was involved in that, but uh, a bit of a tangle there, uh, as it was uh, Samuel Grana there, that other car, into the bus stop. Uh, there we go. It's uh, front to rear contact into a heavy braking zone. There's usually only one person to blame for that. Usually. Yeah, Samuel was just a bit late on the brakes and just they uh, unfortunately tagged, tagged the car in front of him, but both of them have managed to keep going again, and uh, by the looks of it, there's no, no major damage. Just a, just a bit of light contact, but enough to spin that car around. 16 minutes and 20 seconds left remaining in this race session. And the top three in the GTEs. Look at this. There's Miss Gewitz trying to go around the outside of Henrik into their cum. And, well, is he able to complete this move? A slight bit of contact between the two coming through turn number six. And that allows Miss Gewitz to get himself up into that second spot and he's now able to try and do something about Arthur the Hook but there's more lap traffic going to be getting involved in this one in the not too distant future there might be opportunities for Miss Gewitz to be able to work with here if those GT3 cars don't play nice but one of them does already yeah that was a great move by, by, by Miss Gewitz he managed to get the move done and I think they, they left just, just enough room to get, get through the corner and then yeah, Muscuitz uh, on the outside managed to get that move pulled off up into second place, and uh, he's on the on the yeah he's on the hunt for uh, for the hook. Yep, he is. Uh, uh, Muscuitz was fifth coming onto pit lane, and now he's up to seconds and looking to try and challenge for the race lead as the hook uh, dealing with a bit of an out, well a bit of a GT3 roadblock as he will be able to get past without losing too much time. I was scared in that situation he was going to get uh, slowed up through the apex of the corner. Biscuits having to go to the inside through Blanchimont on the Audi. Going to lose a little bit of time as a result there. Meanwhile, you can see that uh, the car of Henry gets through okay on the lap traffic as well. That will be the last of the lap traffic for a little bit of time here for these GTEs, but by the time the race is done, they might catch a mid-pack uh, group of four. Uh, if they're not too careful, but we'll just have to keep an eye on that. There's the battle for the race lead in GT3. Sirica 6.4 seconds ahead of Andres Fernandez. He's made that strategy work, saving a huge amount of fuel through the first stint. Able to go one lap longer than everyone else. Gets the short stop in, and he's just off and away. Yeah, Sirica's basically managed to increase that gap after the pit stops up to about 6.3 seconds, but back up in front in the DTE class, uh, the hook is under attack from Monsieur, so, yeah, and uh, P3 has fallen back a little bit as well, so it's, uh, it looks like these guys are, uh, these guys have been left to, to their own devices to fight for the win. And I'm aware with iRacing's popularity in recent times, we get a lot of comments like, 
Uh, someone on Twitch saying, what game is this? This is iRacing. Go to iRacing.com to see what it's all about. And we do this series every single week on a Friday evening, European time. The IMSA Online Sports Car Championship. We do a lot of other broadcasts as well as part of Race Spot TV. And of course, iRacing themselves do a lot of things uh, with regards to the esports side of racing as well. Uh, with the likes of the e NASCAR Coca Cola iRacing series, with the Porsche Esports Super Cup. Now they're doing real life stuff with the IMSA guys and the NASCAR guys. And it's, uh, it's all getting a little bit insane. Yeah, absolutely. It's been. Yeah, the past few weeks has been it's been pretty crazy with the amount of real life drivers getting involved now. But I think it's a good thing, a good thing rather, and it's good to see it increasing and then uh, gaining pop, gaining popularity as well. And I think uh, if it continues, I think it's uh, it can only be a good thing. Yeah, it can only be a good thing. What is also a good thing? This battle, P1, P2, GTEs, coming up to 12 minutes to go. Skewitz on a charge after his stellar pit stop phase. A bit of a lock of the brakes for the hook, though. Just a puff of tire smoke into there is all he needs. And the Skewitz gained so much time. And now he might be poised for a move, maybe in towards last source. Maybe he's just uh, going to make sure he hits his fuel numbers, as I've seen him uh, lifting off on more than one occasion when it comes to this particular battle. So maybe he's not quite good just yet. But maybe over the next couple of laps when those when those numbers do come to him he'll be much uh, less afraid of going for the attack yeah and, uh, yeah it's a, a four car battle as well and uh, Arthur looks like he's been not, not rattled but as uh, sure it goes for the move on the outside the uh, hook goes to the inside to defend and I think it's going to be a battle of a battle of uh, whoever breaks late yeah they hit the brakes the exact same time into the first part of Lecombe. Now Henrik looks to get himself involved. Benalosa also in this one as well. The pack of four that we saw in the early stages has been re-established. And it could be any one of these four drivers that comes home with the GTE race lead at the end of things. We're about 11 and a half minutes from finding out. And, well, Henry has looked pretty quick so far this race. But I don't think he's had too many opportunities to show it. Maybe he'll start to come alive inside the final 10. Yeah, he's been... He's not really been trying to make any moves from what I see. He's not been trying, like... Not been eager to make a move as quickly as possible. I think he's more than just happy to just stay behind these guys and watch what goes on and if they, if these guys in front of him get called for each other in the closing stages he, he could be there to pick up the pieces so it's a, a good strategy from Patrick just sitting there uh, biding his time yeah and uh, just being the dark horse in this race but there's been an incident between the GTE and the GT3 there that's Sergio Agancio in the Fords let's see what has happened with the Audi He's heading his way out of No Name Corner. It'll be an instant down through Puan, I would have thought. Let's just continue to watch this one through. Oh, it's the Audi that goes off ahead of him. And, oh, this Ford's going to get collected. Bang. Wow. Yeah, that was unlucky for Sergio. He just had nowhere to go. And just uh, the Audi just, uh, just lost it in front, front of him. And... Yeah, Sergio just had nowhere to go and just he was on an unfortunate victim of that instant and boom, yeah, into the wall. Yeah, that's a big one. Agancio out of the race. No fault of his own either. That Audi just got a little bit of a snap while trying to recover from a slide and uh, it was just directly into the pass half of that 4 GT. But GTEs, speaking of 4 GTs, it's a 4 GT party at the front at the moment. Skewitz. Is he going to go for a move this time around, or is he going to stay in line? So far, it's been the latter, but Henrik is closing in and quickly, and Miskiewicz has to move across to try and block the line, and now he tries to make something of it around the outside of the race leader, but he can't get any ground, and Henrik is trying to hound his rear diffuser at the moment. Same with Benalosa on Henrik, so everything's closing up. Everything's just having that massive concertina effect into the Lacombe chicane and uh, these drivers are doing well to avoid each other at the moment but some of these occasions have been pretty pretty sketchy yeah uh, these guys are they fight each other hard but also they're giving each other just enough room and also racing each other hard but fair and they uh, given given respect at the same time but uh yeah it, with about eight minutes remaining in this race i think uh, these guys are, have started have just decided to go for it and just do uh, amongst themselves 
Yeah, absolutely. That'll be the plan. GT3 ahead of them. That the hook just squeezed by through. Absolutely no problems. I'm sure he'll. Uh, I'm sure he'll make that point. But it might impede Miss Hewitt just that little bit more coming through Stavolo 2. And just in the slipstream of it. Now towards driver's right-hand side. Benalosa, fourth in line, has been pretty quiet as well. He's had looks, he's been showing the nose, but he is yet to make any forward progress. And the Audi's not really going to help things here unless he, unless uh, Henrich has a bigger problem with it than he does. But onto the brakes, into the bus stop, they're able to get through just fine. Miskiewicz with a slight error through the couple of apexes there. It does drop a bit of time to the hook, but still very much within drafting range. Yep, and uh, yeah, the hook, the hook gate is uh, built a little bit of a gap, but they, with this, this hook one straight after uh, Paul Ruiz and Radion, they, they'll be able to close that uh, back down as uh, the hook gate has got a bit of uh, GT3 traffic in front of him, so that could, cost, could possibly uh, hold him up. Yeah, but the valve P2 might be more of a thing at the moment because Henrich is just locked onto the back. Of his fellow for GT, he will make the move to drive his left-hand side down the Camel Street. Benalusa's closing in as well. He might decide to make this three wide. He is. There's the block, though, from... Oh, no! Miskiewicz, he's gone off. There's contact. He's able to keep it pointed in vaguely the right direction. He has to keep it, take it across the grass, though, and he has to slow that car way, way down. But, uh, wow, Miskiewicz went for that massive block to prevent Benalusa from making it three wide. Then returned back to the middle line. That's two moves in the braking zone. It's actually a bit of contact from Fenelosa that pushes Miskiewicz wide. But Miskiewicz, that, that was two moves in the braking zone. Yes, it's not technically in the sporting code. But, and if we were FIA rules, it would be uh, the case. But still, it's, it's not the kosher thing to do into that. Yeah, that was a bit... I think that was a bit of a late defeat. It was a... In my mind, uh, a late defensive move by Miskewitz, and it, uh, it was made even worse when he moved twice, and unfortunately that ended up in contact. And unfortunately, Miskewitz uh, went off track, and uh, he's lost uh, a ton of track, a uh, ton of time, and uh, lost lost uh, a couple of positions. But you could say that was a bit. Some of that was his fault. Well, there we go. I would definitely agree with that. But uh, it has spread out this battle, and. Uh, it still remains to be seen whether it will cl actually close up. Now Henrich and Fenelosa are basically all on their own in this battle for P2 at the moment. Uh, Josh Thompson wasn't actually able to capitalize on Miss Goods having his problem. He uh, sits in the background at the moment. And uh, you can see two seconds between him and Miss Goods for the man that started near enough last row in the grid. Uh, he's done a good job to get himself inside the top five. Yeah, it's been a fantastic drive by Joss. He's, a, he's not, not been involved in any any incidents. He's just kept out of trouble. He's just went about his own, just uh, going about doing his own thing. And he, yeah, he's uh, uh, had a great drive so far. And from starting where he was uh, in the GP class, it's been great to watch. But uh, back up to the front in the GP class, he's still got his uh, this, uh, battle going on at the moment. Yeah, two, well, make it three tenths of a second down the Camel Straits and Penelosa just going to lift out of it, not going to carry all the speed into the braking zone of Leco. He has a bit of time to work with, three and a half laps to be able to get this one done, but you know, at this point, you have to consider that Le Hook has just run away at the front of the field. He's been able to gap these guys by about two seconds over the last couple of laps, so he's really, really had a great time. And Henrik and Svenelosa, they haven't really been able to do, any, to do anything about it because they were battling with uh, the Scoots involved. Yeah, it, yeah, offers us basically to get advantage of these guys uh, squab squabbling amongst themselves, seeing just they uh, pulled away and built up, a, built up a bit of a gap. Uh, I don't think uh, these, these two guys behind him will be in the draft range now, so all Afra has to do now is just basically just keep it together and bring it home. Yeah, that is the objective at the moment. Four minutes left remaining. It's a slow car, though. But Tony has had a problem in P13 in your GT3 class. One of the only AMG Mercedes, and uh, I think that's the uh, that's the grass on the entry to Malmody there that has spun the AMG Mercedes around, but keeping it out of the way of everyone, or at least trying to. 
but uh, doesn't cause any incident coming back onto the circuit, which is what you like to see. But uh, yeah, that's sometimes what happens. You, you go over the track limits, you go and slit it on the grass on this uh, on this tire model. Patrick Henry is off into the chicane. What has happened here? It looks like it's a solo car incident. We'll get to see it on the replay. He's gotten the braking stage over and done with before that car swapped ends. We get to see it. There we go. Into the corner. And that has basically spoiled the battle for P2 and 3. Uh, Henrik with a mistake all on his own. Yeah, he just, uh, just lost the rear end on the braking and uh, maybe just, uh, just as soon as he touched the curve but unsettled the car. As he is under attack now from uh, the seek of it. Yeah, he is. The Audi's uh, causing a bit of a problem, though, at least on the, that initial run towards uh, Lacombe. But Miskewitz able to get himself ahead at the moment, and Henrik having to at least try to recover from that slight mistake. And doesn't have a lot of time now to do it in. Two and a half laps, and it's a battle for the final podium position instead of a battle for that second place on the podium. So there we go. We'll take what we can get in this situation. The battles in the prototypes are non-existent. The battles in the front half of the GT3 field are not a thing either. Although there is one for 9 and 10 for, between Herrera and uh, Souza. That might potentially be a thing. But uh, still, this, uh, this race has been bubbling along well. Yeah, it's actually, I've actually really enjoyed this race. I mean, there's not really... Surprisingly, there's not been that many retirements either. So... Uh, fair play to all these drivers who have been racing each other hard, but they've not uh, done anything silly. Uh, and, uh, yep, not many retirements, and I've actually enjoyed this battle in the GT class as well. Yeah, I've definitely enjoyed it as well. It's been giving us a lot of entertainment here today, and hopefully it can give us a little bit in the dying moments of the race as well, as Enreich tries to secure a P3 finish here, but he has a car ahead of him. It has Miss Kiewicz, who has uh, already gotten himself involved in an incident and has not been afraid of those big old defensive moves, so this might be a tough ask here for Henry. Yep, uh, yep, we know what uh, Lauren was like uh, when he was defending, so up the, uh, the straight, uh, up the up the, the second straight, rather, it'll be interesting to see if he does the same thing again and goes for a, a late defensive move or even a block, so yeah, this, uh, this, will, this will be interesting to see. Here we go then, 54 seconds left on the clock here for these two. Not a lot of time at all. Graven is coming up to take the white flag, but that's the good run required by Henrik. Which way is he going to go? He thinks about going right, he thinks about going left and commits to going left here. A long way around for the first apex of Lacombe. If he's able to keep it there, he has the inside for the second apex and he's been able to make it work there. Brilliant pass from Henry Miskiewicz will try to fight it back though. Coming through Malmati, he might even decide to send it down the inside of Rivard. That's why Hen Henry felt he needed to swerve towards the inside there to prevent that from being an option that Henrik back through up into B3. Yeah, that was a great move by Patrick. He managed to pull it off on the outside and again, uh, Laurent was a bit, a bit late with his defensive move, but he, he stuck to his line uh, much earlier uh, than before. So, but I think uh, just watching this now, it looks like Patrick is managing to pull away slightly. Yeah, he is just trying to put those extra tenths of a second, but he needs to put enough tenths of a second so that the slipstream pass into the bus stop doesn't work on this particular lap. As uh, right now, you can see the white flag is out now. So Graven is on his final lap. There's Grana, uh, Grana there has gone out into the gravel and looks like it's a solo car instant. Car going to swap ends again. Oh. Yeah, he's just gonna yeah swap ends. The car, the back end of the car just drifted out a little bit on the entry, and uh, he's uh, gonna have to try and take that one on the chin, I suppose, because uh, that's not what you really want to be doing. But uh, Tim Graven at the moment, he's working his way through Lafania chicane. And I tell you what, this battle for GTEs is actually going to come across the line with one lap to go. So Miss Kiewitz and uh, Henry will actually have one more lap to try and fight this out, and I think. 
if I'm uh, reading this correctly, Henrik has just been able to pull out a good couple of tenths of a second. You can see eight and a half tenths of a second. Henrik has absolutely cleared the Stewart at this stage. But having a look to your overall race leader, he has a four GT ahead of him. That's Giuseppe Moya. But uh, for Tim Graven, it's been a pretty clean race. He was challenged early on by Nick Foster, but Foster had problems with the fuel running out of it on pit lane it left tim graven at the top of the pile in daytona prototypes he's going to come across the line to win in the in the fastest class here today in that number 11 car absolutely no problems at all having a look at your lgt leaders though they are currently heading their way through revive so it's going to be a while before they head their way across the line and uh henrik and miskiewicz miskiewicz has done well, he's gained about three tenths of a second on that opening sector, but that might not be quite enough to be able to wrestle P3 back away from Patrick Henrik. But looking at Sarika at the moment as he works his way through the Lafonia chicane, it was uh, an awesome fuel-saving strategy for Sarika that's been able to get him this race win here today. And even without it, he certainly would have been a big big contender but he seals the deal with the fuel saving heroics and uh, he's off and away completely and utterly clear at the front of the gt3 field and this gte battle for p uh, for p3 is not too far behind him there's actually the race leader in gte so we'll have a simultaneous uh, finish for p1 and p1 p1 in gt3s and p1 in gtes as they hit the brakes for the final time into the bus stop moreno surica will come across the line to win in gt3s and there is arthur the hook in the number three car comes across the line with him to win in gtes of course both of them williams esports affiliated you see Sarika, part of Williams Gym Esports, Arthur the Hook, part of the main Williams Esports team. This is why they decided to give us a little bit of a show across the line. It was Henrik coming home ahead of Miskiewicz there with a last couple of laps pass to get himself up into P3 in GTEs. The last of the runners heading their way across the line at the moment. There is Kimichev heading his way through. He will end up in P7 here today in the GT3 field but that was a that was a pretty calm race it had action in places uh, but Ryan that's a that's a pretty decent one all things considered yeah that was uh that was a great race and uh great great racing and throughout the classes and uh yep uh, that was a good day for the the Williams esports team as well with a win in GT and uh, a win in GT3 yeah, absolutely a great day for that Williams Esports outfit. But here are your official race results from round number four of the IMSA Online Sports Car Championship at Spa Francorchamps. The seven car Daytona prototype field looks like this. You get to see it all in one glance. It's Tim Graven at the front with Zoeklin in second place, place with James King coming home in third. Nick Foster still comes home with fourth despite his fuel issues with Oliver Virol. You see Gustav Grimbergas and uh, Zalto Gorjevic. Yeah, bringing things down to the final positions in that class. GTEs, though, that was the class that was giving us a lot of the action here today. Arthur the Hook able to come away with things in the late stages due to the fact that everyone was scrapping behind him. Fenelosa, Heinrich, Miskiewicz all involved with each other. It's Fenelosa that actually comes home with that P2 spot. Henrik in third, Miskiewicz in fourth. Josh Thompson from the back of the GTE pack comes home with a top ten, top five finish. Ross Woodford in P6. James Pinska in P7. Dmitry Kofanov in P8. Eric Goldner P9. Daniel Lafuente in P10. Giuseppe Moya in P11. Sergio Agancio in P12. John Devalle in P13. Mohamed Patel in 14th. Marcus Nunez in 15th. And Jackie Blotterman will round out the 16-car GTE race results. In GT3's, Moreno Sarika, I said it on his run to the line for the checkered flag. It was a brilliant uh, strategy performance for him today. Comes home with a race win in, well, with 11.2 seconds in hand over Andres Fernandez. Ismail Martel comes home in third place with Nicolas Kowitz uh, uh, in fourth place. 
Louis Gidwe in fifth place, Vlad Kamichev in sixth place, Soren uh, Kolodzi in P7, as Daniel Herrera in P8, Salo Souza in P9, and Ariel Bernardi in the top 10. Andre Mulchers, well, towards the front early on, but not to be towards the end. He comes home in P11, Andres Batoni in P12, Kirill uh, Verhe in P13, Samuel Garana in P14, and Haroldus Georgiotis in P15. But that's the racing done. We have interviews now, and we can actually go straight into them because we have off the hook here inside the commentary booth for uh, that Williams Esports team. And he's the race winner in GTEs. Arthur, you're able to do it here at Spa, but you had a lot of uh, company uh, to, in the sort of second half of the race there, but you were able to pull away by two seconds. Uh, just give me your perspective of the race. Yeah, hi guys. Thanks for for streaming it. Yeah, it was a, a tough one because I... I miss a bit my quality. I start only P5, but I know that during the race my pace was really good. So I've just I have just pushed like a, yeah like quality each lap and save fuel save fuel a bit behind Danny. We had a, a good fight before pit stop because he knows that if I was the first to pit, I think I would have a, a bigger gaps that I have. So yeah. The car was super, super fast at the end, so I really want to thank the team for, for the setup. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a good one for me. So yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we we definitely enjoyed it. It seemed like that GTE field was the main field to be giving us lots of passes and lots of battles here today. And when you saw those guys behind you start to fight it out, at that allowed you to gain the lap time to be able to pull away from them at the very end there. Were you, were you feeling more and more confident as those laps went on towards the end or were you just getting a little bit more nervous? Yeah, I was just wait, waiting the other guys to fight to to give me a, a, a bigger gap. And yeah, after the fight, I, I just need to, to take care and bring home the car. Yeah, and of course, with you coming home with the race win, it's also, uh, well, one part of a double for Williams once again. But uh, of course, Surika, as part of the Williams Jimmy Sports uh, team, coming home with a race win in GT3s. I'll, I'll basically get you guys to do a double interview at this point since you are from uh, related teams. But uh, Moreno in GT3s. Uh, you seem to have a very, very comfortable race uh, today as well. You went one more lap on the fuel than everyone else in GT3s. How did you manage it? Ah, yeah, I mean, after the quali, I saw the results. And I immediately understand that with only three tenths of Delta, wasn't enough to pull away. So I decided to let Andre through the first corner and just stay behind him and save fuel. I was a bit surprised to go one lap longer than him because he was saving as much as me. But yeah, maybe, I don't know, I was even more comfortable than him on that pace. So it, like, it's never easy, you know, when you are racing to do this kind of stuff. But it was good enough, yeah, to have one lap more and then uh, just control the pace in the last part of the race. Uh, I don't know what happened to Andre, but he was like 40 seconds behind me after the pit stop. Yeah, he, he did seem to have a little bit of a problem, but uh, uh, for you guys, of course, uh, in the GT3 machines, which uh, you know have been currently dominated by Audis, at least here at Spa at the moment, and I've seen it as a theme throughout the season as well. What is it about the Audi that makes it so, so good here? Ah, well, we work really hard in the uh, Sebring week the, for the 12 hour. We were basically controlling the, the, pay, the, the race during the 12 hour. Then we had a crash on two hours to go. And yeah, I mean, we have a really good setup and we don't have any other cars at the moment that good for us. That's why maybe we are using only Audi. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, every little advantage possible, right, you, you have to try and go for. But uh, 
uh, back to you, Arthur, just for a, just for a couple of moments because I forgot to allow you to give your shout outs and uh, to mention your sponsors. So you can do that now. Yeah, yeah. I really want to thank Moreno because he also worked with me to make uh, this setup for the photo. Yeah, <laughs> he win it also in GT3, so I'm really happy for him. Um, also, last week at Road America, we finished 1, 2, and 3 in GT3. And now we won both classes, so GT and GT3. So, yeah, William Cispo is back in the business, I want to say. <laughs> and yeah, big thanks to all the sponsors Fanatec, Zingvel, Chill Blast, Weather, and all the guys from the team. Also, to you guys, it's always a pleasure to, to watch again the race after. <laughs> Yeah, it's always a pleasure to commentate on you guys as well. Moreno, is there anything to add? I mean, Arthur already said everything. <laughs> there we go. Just just by virtue of being from related teams, you get all your sponsors done in one uh, in one person. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Arthur and Moreno from Williams Esports and Williams Gym Esports, coming home with the GTE and the GT3 race wins, respectively. And now we can get to talk to the overall race winner, uh, the Daytona prototype winner of Tim Graven for Simsa Esports. And Tim, you won by 7.3 seconds here today, but for the opening portion of that race, you were, uh, well, you had company in the form of Nick Foster, but it seemed like you had your fuel numbers in the right order and he didn't. Uh, yeah, for the first part, my fuel was fine. Um, I crossed the line with like a 0.2 uh, liters of fuel, so it was very, very short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it was quite marginal and uh do you find that is the case all the time here at spa due to the long lap time uh you know it, it's more about managing um your nose before the pit stop um with the splitting of the tires and the fuel uh getting some front nose damage is like really dangerous for your uh overall race pace um because all that all the damage you get right now is just uh you know kind of a, like a penalty yeah, it does seem like those Daytona prototypes can be pretty sensitive uh, to the damage, but you're able to deal with it well. And uh, of course, you are one of those drivers that uh, is, you know, at least out of the drivers that run the Daytona prototype regularly on in the IMSA series, not just in special events. You're considered to be one of the very, very, very quick drivers, but... You know, is there anyone else out there that you'd like to see take part in these events like uh, like Nick that would be able to challenge you at the front of the field? Or, or are you just comfortable to be winning every single race now? Um, I would love competition. You know, iRacing is all about um, making sure you're pushing yourself to be the best. And in order to do that, you need competition to actually see if you're up there. Like right now, there's not a lot of people that drive the DP. Um, mainly because the car is not one of the newer ones. Um, but it's just a lot of fun. And I hope that by driving and these like primetime broadcasts that people will, uh, will start to drive the DP a bit more often than just special events. There we go because uh, you know it is a car that is capable of giving us some um, uh, some great action. It, it does that in the special events. It's just seem, seeming like no one wants to run it in the uh, uh, in the regular season. But uh, for you, it's uh, an opportunity to maybe farm a little bit of our rating. Uh, it's I, I rating is just a bonus. Like it's more about the traffic, having fun, and uh, you know, enjoying racing in general, especially now. There we go. And uh, of course, you you come from the Simsa esports team. Is there anyone there that actually helps you out with these races, or is it more of a more of a lone wolf job? No, no, no. The team is like helping every step of the way in multiple aspects. So like everyone is helping out, testing, um, giving feedback on setups. You know, it's really a bit more than you know just the team. It's really helping each other out uh, every now and again. There we go. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Tim, and uh, congratulations on the race win. Thank you, and uh, thank you guys for uh, broadcasting, of course. Yeah, absolutely no problem. Thank you very much. And there we go. That is the in interview stage done. We get to talk to all three class winners. And uh, all of them obviously uh, pretty happy with their performances. And, you know, we we we've, we've seen a decent race here today as well, Ryan. Yeah, it's been... 
yeah, it's been a, been a, a decent race, like you say. Uh, not the most exciting, but still the uh, great racing, especially in the GT class. And uh, at the end of the race, we had uh, three deserving winners in in uh, every class. So there we go. We've got four rounds in the books here in the IMSA Online Sports Car Championship. Next week, we head to the Glen. Uh, for more IMSA racing action and of course after that we go to Barcelona Silverstone and then we finish off with that North American run through May with the final five rounds of the season but we're all done here for this evening I'm Connery Maddock that's been Ryan Walker we've had Paul Smith pushing all those buttons to make things happen and we see Istvan Balo providing us our wonderful track TV cameras. We'll see you guys same time, same place next week on the iRacing Esports Network for more IMSA Online Sports Car Championship action. Goodbye. <laughs>